Good morning, Potter's House, North Dallas family. Those of you that are in the room, those of you that are joining us online, we welcome you to our Sunday service. Listen, every Sunday is a celebration here at the Potter's House, North Dallas. We are so grateful that you're with us today, that you're tuning in wherever you're at. Hit that like and share button. Share us with us your prayers, any testimonies that you have, because we are praying for you. We have just a few announcements, and I have a special guest that's about to join me in just a moment. But right now, I want to encourage you guys, if you did not watch last Sunday's service where our pastor Brady preached, we are in the Reset series on our prayer life and building that altar. It was amazing. I'm so excited about this series. We have a few more Sundays left. Today is going to be amazing. Also, Better Together Marriage Ministry. We are going to be on site here this coming Wednesday at 7 p.m. We want you to join us. We're going to be talking about our For Richer or Poorer series. We're going to have some testimonies, some strategies, some tools, because one thing that we want to do is we want to build stronger marriages. But sometimes we have to get into small group conversations and talk these things out. Amen. So please won't you join us. We will be starting right at 7 p.m. You are so welcome to be with us. Also, April 21st, everybody knows what that is already. Pastor Brady's birthday celebration Sunday. It's going to be so much fun. We have Apostle Joshua Giles who is going to be joining us. You do not want to miss that. Bring your love, bring your energy, bring your cards, whatever you want to do to be a blessing to Pastor. That is the Sunday to do that. Also, you know, we have been collecting food, a lot of food. I want to just say thank you guys on behalf of Pastor Bishop, our pastoral team and staff for donating. We were able this week to donate over 300 pounds of food to the Allen Community Pantry Outreach. We were so able to be such a blessing. Pastor Keys, we just want to thank you for working that out. He is always working on the community, taking care of our seniors, taking care of all of us. Sometimes I say Pastor Keys is like Jesus. He's like a present help in the time of need. <laughs> we love you, Pastor Keys, and just thank you so much for being such a blessing. And shout out to Rose Horn, to all the Belong Singles who came out for the game night. That was so much fun. I heard a lot of great stories about that. I also want to tell you guys something else. April is Autism Awareness Month. And I want to talk just a little bit today with you guys about understanding autism awareness. I'm going to bring on right now my special friend, Portia Dawson. She is, <laughs> she is my good friend, but she is a, I call her a mama bear. She is a rock star of a mom. She has four boys with her awesome husband, Marcus Dawson. You are a powerhouse. You know that? She is little. She is pretty, but when I tell y'all she is a strong woman of God, she is amazing. And she has been a blessing to not only her family, but our church family. Her and her amazing son, Callie, they were able to come this week, and they donated hundreds of books, puzzles, to, wow. be, to be a blessing to our church, to our ministry. We want to just, first of all, say thank you for that. Thank you for that. But I just have a couple questions for you. If you would just talk to us for just a minute. If you were talking to someone who, uh, first of all, can you greet the people of God real quick? <laughs> hello. Hello, everyone. But if you were talking to a parent or another person who may not be impacted by autism spectrum in their family or a caregiver that they are, a loved one that they're caregiving for, what would you say to someone else to just encourage them on understanding and compassion? Just know that our kids are like any other kid, any typical kid. They just want to be accepted. They want yeah. to be understood. They want to be loved. They want to be included. They yeah. want to be supported. And they want friends supported. just like anyone else. Yes, yes. Thank you for that. Also, talk to us a little bit about, um, let's see, it, as far as the school system, mm -hmm. how important is it that you speak up and be an advocate for your child, whether they're on the spectrum or have any type of a learning disability. How it's, important is that? It's very important. Because if you don't advocate for your child, no one else will. Absolutely. No one knows your child better than you do. Absolutely. You know their ups, their downs, their learning styles, their behavior manners. 
behaviors, um, patterns, and things like that. No one knows your child like you do. That's right. And listen, what we don't want is we don't want people putting our kids into any kind of a cookie cutter system, okay? Don't fall for that. It's so important that we use our voice yes. because like you said, they don't know your child as well as you do. There are so many great people in the school system, but we have to partner with Absolutely. them. And they want us to partner with Absolutely. them in the school system, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Amen. Thank you for that. Also, if you could share with us just for a moment how to be careful to not overlook signs. I know in your family, Callie, your amazing son, he is on the spectrum. How old is Callie now? He is 23. 23 years yeah. old. Yeah. She is raising some grown men who are amazing, so we're excited about that. But talk to us for just a moment about how to be careful to like watch for signs and where to go to and who to ask for help. Well, if you see signs, don't overlook it, mm -hmm. okay? And don't feel ashamed that something just is yeah. uh, really something bad is wrong with your child. Go get help. Yeah. And it, and it doesn't matter how many times you go, get a second opinion, a third opinion, a fourth opinion, yeah. whatever makes you feel comfortable, but go get help. And don't feel yeah. ashamed that when they, you do get a diagnosis uh, of autism or any kind of special yeah. needs or dis disorder or whatever it may be, don't feel ashamed about that. And it's just a diagnosis. Absolutely. And it's not need, the end. We need ask for help. It's okay to ask mm -hmm. for help. But yeah. also, in just our few moments, would you share some words of encouragement, maybe even just about self-care for families and caregivers who are taking care of our loved ones? Always take care of yourself. Always put yourself, because the thing is, you're taking care of your child and you're needing they're needing you, so you have to take yeah. care of you first. And sometimes you gotta put that mask Absolutely. on yourself and do good things for Absolutely. you and reward yourself, right? Yes. Reward, reward yourself, Absolutely. whether it's ice cream, a walk, a date night, whatever that yeah. looks like. Be strengthened today, be encouraged today. Know that you are not alone. There is the website, National Autism, Autism Association. Asso Association. Yes. National Autism Association. You can go there for resources and help. And hey, listen, if you see this beautiful lady around here, just know that she loves you, she's praying Absolutely. for you. And if you Absolutely. wanna reach out to her and just ask her Absolutely. for a word of encouragement, she is our very own. She is our family at this That's church. Right. But listen, today, we are going into the presence of the Lord. If you're in the room, just go ahead and jump up on your feet. If you're online with us, won't you join us? Today is a great day to give God the praise. We love you, family. Let's go. Hallelujah. It is a great day to glorify the name of our God because there is still power. There's still resurrection power. There's still healing power in the name of Jesus. Do you know that there's still power to save? to heal, power to deliver, power to set free, power to redeem, power to restore. So we honor the name of Jesus this morning because it's a name above every name. The God who is with us, Emmanuel.
your neighbor and if they don't have a smile, give them one of yours and tell them he's in the room. He's in the room. He's in the room. Heaven has heard us. Heaven has heard our cry. He is walking among us. Let him touch you today. Let him touch your mind today. Let him give you peace today. Let him bring back your joy today. He's here for you. He's here for you. Woo! Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Tell your neighbor he's in the room. He's got everything you need today. If you're watching at home, he's in your room. Yeah. But now that he's here, you ought to praise him like you want something. Like you need something. Like you expect something. Like you can't make it without him. Gotta have him. He's in the room today. He's in the room. 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 All hands. of the Lord in here that should make everybody feel welcome he's in the room for you he's here today whatever you have need of whatever has you pressing your way into the house of God he is here for that he's here for that that thing right there I'm 
grateful for his presence. Because let me tell you something. If we all come together and we don't have the presence, we have all failed. I said we failed. I don't want to be in a church that don't seek after the presence of God. Because I don't care how good you sing. It ain't good enough to break a yoke. I said it ain't good enough. I don't care how good you play. It ain't good enough to break the yoke. So we have to have him and his presence. And today I feel it in the room. One more time. Look at somebody and tell him it's the, he's in the room. He's in the room today. Aren't you grateful that you're in the room that he's in? I'm in the room that he's in. That's what happens when we come together and we give him our whole heart and our whole focus and our whole attention and we call on him. Old folks used to say, if you'll call on him, he'll come see about you. I hear that in my spirit. Call on him, Cheryl. He'll come and see about you. Ain't no way in the world I can call on him and him not say, hey, wait, I got to find, I got to go where she is. He is that kind of God. It's tithe and offering time in the house of the Lord. Any givers in the house? I said, are there any givers in the house? Is there anybody in the house that knows when you honor the principles of God that the God of the principles turns around and honors you? I know that. I shouldn't be blessed like I am, but he has blessed me. And I'm grateful because I made it a point to honor God and to honor the principles of God. And let me tell you this, tithing, not, it's, it's, not, it's not the money that blesses God. It's the obedience that blesses God. And when you become obedient by bringing him your tithe and your offering, look at somebody and tell them, we do it together. We do it together. And I don't know if y'all heard the, in the pre show I think is what uh, they were talking about. Lana was telling uh, us that they that we have given uh, away over 300 pounds of food this week to somebody that was hungry. Aren't you glad that you're feeding the hungry? What, what about all what's going on up here? Look at the screen. Look at the carpet. If y'all, if y'all are just here today for the first time, you, you probably don't notice this carpet. But for us who have stood on it for the last five or seven or whatever, many years, and it be semen under our feet, we appreciate it. Amen? If you want to lay out, you can lay out. Isn't that awesome right there? But the Lord is blessing us. He is blessing us. And in not many days hence, the wall will come down. Hallelujah. Bishop, you brought the other wall down. <laughs> Bring this one down too. It's going to come down in Jesus' name and in his, his perfect timing when it is safe. And uh, it's going to be a blessing. We're going to have room to increase. Tell somebody we need more room. We're going to have room to increase. And we thank God. It's because you're faithful. It's because you give. It's because you put God first. You can always see where your money goes to work at the Potter's House of North Dallas. We're grateful. We're grateful to be givers. We're grateful to be people that understand the principle of God. And God has blessed us because of that. Today, if you have your tithe, your tithe is 10%. Whatever God has given you, you owe him 10%. And it's even people that, that, that may not even come to the church. People that have businesses understand that there's a principle that happens when we give back. How many of you know that? You got to know that. So today I want you to get your tithe. I want you to get an offering together in your hand. And we're going to lift it up before the Lord. If you want to give on, this, uh, on your devices, you can because all that information is on the screen. If you're at home, you can do the very same thing. If you're in the building and you want to put it in an envelope and actually bring it down here and lay it on the altar, you can do it that way. If you want to put it in the box on your way out the door, you're free to do that. Any way you bless the Lord in your giving, it'll be all right today. Amen. I want those of you that have your tithe, your offering, I want you to lift it up in your device or the envelope, whatever you have, just lift it up high. If, you, if you're in this room and you say, I, I need a blessing, I need a job this week, Pastor Brady, lift up your hand, lift it up. We've had some people get jobs this week. Y'all remember us praying about it last week? We prayed about it and there's some people that got jobs this week. We're going to continue to believe God 
We're not going to forget about that because I understand you need that. Lift it up high. Lift your hand up high. If you just want to be under this prayer, I want you to stand because I want to pray for you. Father, in the name of Jesus, what a privilege and what an honor it is for us to bring to your house the first fruits of our increase. You have blessed us. Lord, and today we want to bless you back. We bless you back by tearing off the portion that belongs to you. And today, we mark this as a time of worship. This is not a time that we just get things out of the way. This is a time of worship. It's a time when we say, thank you for the strength to bless us, to gain increase. Thank you for the strength to go to work. Thank you for the opening of jobs for us. Thank you for being the food on our table that you have been. Thank you for being a counselor late in the midnight hour. Thank you for being direction for our feet. Thank you for opening every door that you've opened for us. Thank you that we're not going to miss you, but you're going to move so clearly and so precisely in our lives that we'll say, this is the way, walk ye in it. We pray for increase, God. Even as Jabez prayed for increase, we pray for increase that you would bless us. Bless us in the city. Bless us in the field. Bless us going in. Bless us coming out. We cry out for the blessing of Jehovah to be on our house, our family, and our lives. And we ask you to do it today. And we ask it in the name of Jesus. Somebody shout amen. If you're a giver, shout amen. You can bring it down here if you want to. If you are at home, you know how to give. The instructions are on the screen. And while they're coming, I just want to say how grateful I am today to have the bishop in the house looking. Oh, you got to get up today. You better get on up. And button that suit coat. He's cute, y'all. That's just all I'm going to tell you. He's cute and he's mine, okay? He's cute and he's mine, and I love him today. Uh, thankful to all of our leaders, to all of our elders, to all of those who serve in this house. Come on, better clap for everybody else, too. Come on. It ain't just the bishop that's special. It ain't just the pastor. Come on, it's everybody. We couldn't do anything without, without having those of you that are here that are serving. And what I love about this church is that y'all serve the Lord with gladness. And that's an important thing. I want to ask you to jump back up on your feet for a minute. Then we're going to let you sit down as soon as our praise team and worship team takes us just a little bit further. Uh, Pastor Sanchez, where are you at today? Hey, y'all, this is a wonderful man of God and his wife. Is this your daughter? Oh, my Lord. These people used to be a part of our staff at the river when we were in North Carolina. They're here visiting us today. Can y'all make them feel welcome? We are so grateful y'all are here. They are faithful people, and we're glad that they are with us today. And as I prepare to move out of your way, I'm going to ask you, you know, we, we began our series about resetting uh, prayer in our life. And... I want to encourage you, if there's ever been a time to pray, this is the time that we should pray. Um, this week, I want you to pray for peace in the Middle East. We need that to calm down. We need that to cease in the name of Jesus. And we are going to, how many, how many of y'all will pray and agree that God will bring peace everywhere, okay? Everywhere in the world. The world needs peace. In the, he, the world needs peace. We still have hostages that need to be released, right? We want to pray for the peace in the Middle East. And we're going to pray that God be glorified in, in some way that God will be glorified. And the devil will be horrified at the prayers of the righteous. Do you know when you pray, God does amazing things? There's something about your prayer. When your voice takes to the atmosphere, when your voice says, God, in the name of Jesus, things shift and things move. And so we want to just encourage you to build your altar this week and reset that prayer life of yours. 
Because the enemy doesn't want you to pray. He don't want to hear the sound of your voice. And he'll try everything he can to shut it up. But you ought to holler right now to let him know. No, 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 no. I will lift my voice in the name of Jesus. Woo! Yes, because he has caused me to triumph in every area of my life. So we want to pray. Pray for leaders around the world as well. And uh, Pastor Travis is going to come momentarily and bring us the word of the Lord on prayer today. Do y'all thank God for the pastors in this house? Pastor Travis, Pastor Jeremy, Pastor Joseph, Pastor Tina, Pastor Lana. We want to thank God for all of them who serve this body diligently. And so I, I thank God for you. I want you to just lift your hands and say, Lord, take me higher. Come on, tell him again, take me higher. Come on, Pastor. Come on, can we lift our hands all over the room? Because this is a house of worship. This is a house that understands the power of the presence of God. That one moment in his presence can change everything about our past, about our present and even into our future. So God, we engage you now. Come on, lift your voices all over the room. Hallelujah. We want to hear from you. We need a word from you. We want to feel your peace. We need to know your power. We worship you, God. Jesus. Bless your name. This is a house of words. This is a house of prayer. Where every
to dwell in your house forever. That's what David said. Come on, there's miracles in the room right now. Come on, there's miracles in the house right now. I declare that there's miracles while you're watching us and worshiping with us online. This is your moment, this is your season for the reset in your life. Reset in your health, reset in your finances, reset in your body, regulate, regulate. Woo. In the name of Jesus, this is the house. Come on, you need a physical healing. Come on, lift your hands in the room. Heal, Father, now, in the name of Jesus. By faith, we declare it to be so that you're going to heal. You're going to set free in the name of Jesus. Come on, you got to declare it out of your mouth. This is the house. This is the house. Here we go. Today is going to mark. Today you're going to be marked by the miracle that takes place in your life. Come on, there it is. I feel the Spirit of God moving. Yes. Grab your neighbor by the hand. Father, in the name of Jesus, we declare and we have decreed that this is a house of miracles. We thank you because there is nothing that separates heaven and earth. <laughs> it is your presence that is the tapestry that binds heaven and earth, that creates a Kairos moment, that creates divine intervention, that creates a moment where we can hear and experience your greatness and your goodness. I thank you, Father, for you declared that the kingdom was near. And so, Father, we squeeze our neighbor's hand and whatever they need in their life, we're, 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 we're declaring strength in their life. We're declaring hope in their life. We're declaring peace in their life. God, I thank you because this is the house where things change. This is the place where you reside. You abide in the praises of your people. You abide in this house. You abide in this temple. This temple called the temple of the Holy Spirit, Father. We thank you, God, for a building. God, but we thank you for your presence. God, what is a building if we don't have your presence? What is a place if we don't have your presence? What is an instrument if there is no presence? What is a keyboard if there's no presence? What if there's psalmist but there is no presence? We thank you for your presence in this place in the name of Jesus. And we declare, God, that this is the house of change. This is the epicenter of change. This is the epicenter of change. This is the epicenter of change. Lives will be changed and set free, delivered. Set free and delivered. Set free and delivered. Set free and delivered. Deliver. Salvation, restoration, be your portion today. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. That name that is above every name. That name that every knee shall bow. And every tongue shall confess that you are Lord. In the name of Jesus. Squeeze your, squeeze your neighbor hand and say in the name of Jesus. Today you're going to rise up. Today you're going to walk. Today strength is coming back into your life. There's a reset. There's a restoration. There is a spiritual download that's about to hit your life that is going to change the trajectory of your spiritual life and your natural life in the name of Jesus I don't want to be the same I don't want to be the same I don't want to be the same I want to be changed I want to be renewed I want to be transformed I'm going to pray till you get your breakthrough I want to be changed I want to be renewed I want to be restored I want to be transformed by the renewing of my mind let revelation flow let insight flow let your power flow let the apostolic grace 
that is on this house let it flow let it flow let gifts be activated let gifts be activated let spiritual maturity be activated let emotional intelligence be activated in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus loose your neighbor's hand and clap your hands and give God a shout of glory shout of glory come on take the roof off this place Shout till every wall comes down. Hallelujah. Hey, 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 hey. Look right. at somebody around you and tell you I'm a miracle. I'm a miracle. Tell them I just didn't receive a miracle. Tell them I am a miracle. I shouldn't be standing here today. I shouldn't be breathing here today. I shouldn't be walking here today. Nobody should have rolled me in a wheelchair today. I brushed my teeth by myself today. I comb my hair. You put on your eyelashes by yourself. Tell somebody I am a miracle. I'm a blood, I'm a live, breathing miracle. If you want to see what the grace of God looks like, if you want to look like, if you want to look at somebody and know what the hand of the Lord looks like, tell them my life is proof that God is a restorer. My life is proof that God is a healer. My life is proof that God will keep you. My life is proof that He will rescue you. Tell them my life is proof. Y'all ain't talking to nobody. Turn around to the neighbor behind you and tell them I am a miracle. If you want to see what the goodness of the Lord is, look in my eyes. Look at my teeth. Look at my, tell her I am a miracle. That's why you can't come to church and be bougie. That's why you can't come to church and be crazy. You got to know that somebody's standing in the middle of a miracle. There they are, but I am a miracle. How about your neighbor? Say, neighbor, I am a miracle. You should have been aborted. Your mama should have aborted you. She tried to abort you, but she couldn't abort you because your destiny had to get into the earth. Tell them I'm proof. Tell them I'm proof. Tell them my life shouldn't be as good as it is right now. I know you got some struggles and you got some issues and you got some things you're working in, but somebody ought to, the greatest thing that you could ever lose is your memory. But I got a good memory that it shouldn't have turned out this good. That car accident should have, that car accident at 17 should have killed me. But I, I'm here today. I'm here today. Are you grateful to be in the house of the Lord? We done slipped over into something in there. Are you grateful for our leaders? Come on, let's celebrate Bishop and Pastor Brady. We honor you. We honor the leaders that is in this house. We honor you. Take 60 seconds right now. I see you. Go ahead and reach for him. There's something he gave me, but guess what? Go ahead and reach for him. Take 60 seconds. I see you, young man. Reach for him right now. Reach for him right now. He's going to answer your prayer today.
this living sacrifice. Accept this. Come on, lift it one more time. That's my song right there. grateful to be in the presence of the Lord this morning. Uh, I want to give honor to my wife. Um, we will celebrate 16 years of marriage on April the 19th. Look at that, y'all. Why are my lips purple? But... Yeah, 16 years, four kids later, so grateful to God. Come on, clap your hands and thank God for my beautiful wife. Thank you, all of our leaders. Um, I'm going to have you to be seated. I'm not going to do the traditional, uh, what I typically do is read a text and read a scripture, but I want you to be seated, uh, And but just look at somebody and tell them, Tell me who I am. That's, that's my subject today. Uh, tell me who I am. You stay right there uh, for a minute now. Take drop out. Uh, I want to share something with you because a pastor um, mentioned uh, a few months ago that, um, that she really sensed that men... God was really calling or sensing that she wanted to see more men uh, in prayer. And um, um, because I oversee our men's ministry, the Man Cave, and uh, if you haven't been to the Man Cave, I invite you out. Uh, we meet on the second Monday of every month, um, so you can come in May if you would like. But... <clears throat> Prayer is very dear to my heart. My father taught me how to pray. Yeah, all right. And um, every, every morning, we would, uh, every morning, without fail, every morning. <laughs> Before he left for work, he would grab all of us. We had to get out of the bed. You can go back to sleep if you want to. But we had to get up and we had to hold hands and pray. And for so long, I really thought God lived somewhere. I, we didn't have, <laughs> I mean, I thought he like lived in the attic. I like, you know, for, as a kid, I thought God, there was another man living in the house because of his fervor. And my life is just an overflow of his answer prayer. And... Um, But men, uh, when I began to talk to some of the guys, they said, Pastor, some of us have been in the church and we have seen prayer done. We have ex experienced it. We experienced the how of it. But we don't know how to pray. We've experienced, we've seen it being done, but could you break it down for us? And I love doing that. I love taking complicated things and making it simple if I can. Yeah. And the, here's the key that I discovered. The discovery was not, hear this, was not in showing a man the practice of prayer. Is that the many of us could not step into prayer is because we don't know our true identity in God. 
when you understand your true place in God and know who you are, then you know what's truly available to you. And so we broke some things down. And so this message today is really an overflow of what I have, some of what I have shared with some of the men. And I've had to uh, make it applicable to the ladies too. I ain't going to leave y'all out, ladies. But this message is centered around your identity because it is very possible in the 21st century to be practicing something that you don't know what you're doing. And because you're not getting the results, you think it doesn't work. Don't realize... You got to know who you are. Now, I know I just offended some of y'all by saying you don't know who you are because you know, you don't, you haven't seen my resume. I'm an adult. I'm old enough to be your mama. Yes, you are. But if you don't know scriptures to break down to someone who doesn't know Jesus and teach them their identity in Jesus... I don't care how much money you got in the bank. I don't care who, what you do, where you are. If you can't win nobody to Jesus... Watch, watch this. And you can't use, you are fearfully and wonderfully made by God. That's elementary, baby. My kids know that. I'm going to be nice today. But look at somebody and say, tell me who I am. Now, I want to introduce you to two brothers. I want to introduce you to two brothers by the name of Alex and Marcus Lewis. Alex and Marcus Lewis are two brothers. And at the age of 18, Alex was in a terrible motorcycle accident. And it left him in a coma. They wrote a book about it and they have a Netflix series on their life called Tell Me Who I Am. And I stumbled across this in my preparation. I had no idea that this was even a story out there when I came up with the title and all that kind of stuff like that. I just researched to, to see what was out there like that. And I stumbled across uh, their book and their documentary and read the audio book and watched the documentary. And Alex was in a terrible motorcycle accident and it left him in a coma. They are identical twins. But when Alex emerged from the coma, the only person he remembered was his brother Marcus. Just imagine to yourself, everything you knew before, you completely lost. It's gone. Your childhood, gone. He didn't even recognize his mother. His mother was kissing him, trying to love on him, saying he's awake. He didn't even know who his mother was. His father, he didn't know who his father was. He had a girlfriend. He forgot who his girlfriend was. He had no idea who he was. His parents were distant. His mother started living in denial. The major thing is that even though he doesn't have a memory... He does have a twin brother. And the major thing about having a twin is that you'll never be alone. So even though he can't remember, he's not alone. He has nothing to latch on to. He has nothing to anger him apart from Marcus. Marcus teaches him, watch this, not how to, not how to brush his teeth. He had to teach him what a toothbrush was. He had to teach him what breakfast is. This is breakfast. This is lunch. We do it around this time. He literally has to teach him how to walk. He teaches him how to do life again. Almost up until the age, like, like, like a baby to the age of nine. He's this kid who's lost everything. And Marcus is the only person that helps him in his life that shows him who he is, that tells him about stories of their childhood. And Marcus paints this beautiful picture about their lives. You know, one of the things is uh, uh, twins have a very unique bond. 
my wife and uh, her twin sister Tina, do not play them in any game like taboo or anything like that because they have the same brain. They have the same brain. So me and Pastor Chris and, uh, uh, and uh, my brother-in-law, Mark, and Lana knows she experiences as well. We don't play them in games at all because you literally have to blind them. You have to cover their faces because it's like they know the answer. They teleport the answer to each other's brains. <laughs> at first, Alex functions like a child asking basic questions. What is this? What is that? Nearly everything he has to relearn, and he rapidly matures, and Alex begins to ask questions about their childhood. Marcus paints a picture of a happy, wealthy, well-connected family for Alex. He only has one fact in his mind, and he built everything around that fact, and that fact was that his brother would tell him the truth, that everything between him and his brother was honest and truthful, and there is never a secret between them two. Everything Marcus tells him about himself, he believes it. And he puts his past back together and helps shape his future. He trusts him. There was, no, there was ever, never a reason for him to ever doubt him. He relies on him day and night. Watch this. But later, after his father died and his mother passed away, some of y'all are like, I'm going to watch this documentary tonight. <laughs> later, after his parents passed away, Alex and Marcus finds a picture, an image that changes everything. That image caused Alex to raise some further questions about the life Marcus told him they experienced as children. And instinctively, Alex felt that there was, there was much, has to be some details about their lives that Marcus omitted. The image raised questions. The image raises questions about the details that the person that he entrusted to believe everything not all completely true. Marcus does not immediately tell him what the details are that he omitted, but in fact, there were details about their life Marcus intentionally buried in his own mind and was hoping to never dig up. These Missing details, however, causes Alex to question everything about his identity and the image that his brother Marcus had ever told him. There is nothing worse than discovering that someone has left you out, or has left out imperative details that are crucial to the story or the narrative or the situation. Look at somebody and tell them, don't leave out the details. I can't make decisions without clear details. Anybody who's in leadership, I can't have half the story. I can't just have your perspective. I got to have all the details in order to make a qualitative decision about what we should do. There's nothing worse than somebody leaving out details. And the truth is that you who are listening to me right now in this room and online, you have spent time in your life. Some of you have faced some emotional trauma and some situations because you found out something, somebody in your family left out some details. Y'all are going to talk to me here today. We're going to shift out of that word. But you have found out and you've discovered that somebody left out some crucial details to your life, to your family, to your parents. You got a whole brother that you, that you went to school with and didn't even know that that was your brother. Y'all looked alike, but nobody ever told you that was your... Hey, well, we got to work a little bit like that, 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 that. You got a whole nother, your granddaddy had a whole nother family on the other side of town. Your, your... Yeah. 
Some of you were adopted into families as babies or as children. And thank God for people that adopt children. Thank you for those individuals that have that heart. But, but eventually that child grows up looking and realizing that I don't look like nobody in this house. It's just kind of like Moses was. It says, by faith Moses came to the conclusion that he should not be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Because Moses looked at Pharaoh's daughter and said, Yo, our toes don't look alike, our fingers don't look alike. Who my daddy is. You ain't never told me who my daddy was. You raised me, but who my daddy is. Be careful about leaving out crucial details, even if it exposes your own weakness. I discovered that through the Apostle Paul, most of the epistles, he is not only defending the faith and establishing churches, but he sends letters full of details about their identity in Christ. He sends them Detailed letters, y'all got to read, I mean, they're so detailed that many times in Rome and all of these other places, there were so many different ideologies and so many theological uh, 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 thoughts out there. Because of it being in Rome and, and, and when he sends the letters uh, to Galatians or the church at uh, 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 those churches and Ephesus and all those places that he, that he discovers now that he has to defend the faith. But the way that he defends the faith is by reminding the people who they are in Christ. Not who they are by the law, but who they are in Christ. Who they are not by Moses' law, but who they are in grace. That we don't live by the law, but we live in grace. So he has to remind the people who they are. The reason why you come to church is not to just shout, not to just, chant, just dance. You are here so that God can remind you who you are in here. God sends you to this place collectively. We worship him, but we are reminded who we are because when we go back out into the world, there are some things that we get under and we get attacked and we come up under that if you don't know who you are in God, and people have spent billions of dollars going to conferences, pilgrimages, personality assessments, strength finders, ideograms, trying to do all of these assessments to find out who they are. And I'm not against those things. I believe in those things. But can I also tell you that those personality assessments and strength finders and emotional intelligence and values tests and core values tests, all those assessments have the potential to fluctuate. They fluctuate because they are subjective, not objective. They fluctuate because they are based upon your position, your experience, your, watch this, your emotions at, in the moment. And watch this, if you're going to be fully honest when you take the assessment. The truth of the matter is they ask you about 10 different questions a different way just to see if you're going to be honest about where you are. And the truth of the matter is you done lied on them assessments. You don't. But here is what I want you to understand. I am not against self-help. I am not against a therapist. I believe in them. I help people. I, I believe in all of these assessments. And I do think that those things, watch this, can support you. But they are not the thing that teaches you exactly who you are as a believer. If you don't know the word of God, you... Okay. See, 
What required, what is a requirement here, I'll get back to Paul. What is a requirement here is that we teach everything but the word of God. We believe everything they say on TikTok. We believe everything somebody's saying on Instagram. But we don't get in a book for ourselves and believe what the book says. I hear people talking about, yeah, I know what the word says, but, but I know what he says. No, no, no. The question is, do you believe what the... I, I, I need to know, do you actually believe what is written there? That this thing, yes, there's errors, and yes, there's add-ons, and yes, there's a... But if you are a Christ-like believer, you got to believe the book. Look at somebody and tell them, you got to believe the book. Let me hold your book. You got to believe the book. You can't just read the Bible. Travis Green said, you can't just read the Bible. You got to read the Bible. You can't just look at this thing as a, just an ancient thing that doesn't have the ability to find out where you are, to teach you who you are. My great-grandmama was taught by the Word. They didn't want her to read, but she found out how to read. My great-grandfather started two churches in a 15-mile radius that are still set today. Why? Because it was built on the word. I don't know about this carpet. I still don't know about this carpet. Good God Almighty. Touch somebody and tell them I'm built on the word. I'm not built on my bank account. I'm not built on my resume. I'm not built on my car. I'm not built on any, on my talent. Watch this. I'm not built on my gift. I'm built on the word of Come on, where, the, where are my Bible believers that believe that? Where are my Bible believing saints that believe that the Word of God has the authority to change you, renew you? It has the ability to reach down to the next generation and teach them who they are. Tell somebody, I still believe in the book. I still believe what the Bible says. I still want to become what the Bible says. It's not just, uh, it's just not emotionalism. It's just not a way. Church is not a game to me. Me standing before you is not a game. This is not a game that we play. This is something I live. This is something that I'm convicted by. This is something that I'm persuaded in. I don't care what you think. I don't care where you are. This ain't a game. My Christ, I still believe in Jesus. I still believe believe in the power of the Holy Ghost. I still believe in deliverance. I still believe in change. I still believe that God sits on the throne. Tell somebody I still believe in the book. I still believe in the book that he can heal me because of what's written in the book. He can heal me and change me because when what's in the book. He can help me through my grief because of what's in the book. He can change my life. He can change your spouse because of what's in the book. But you will never become what the book says you can become if you don't get in the book. Look at your neighbor and say, you got to get in the book. I don't care. They done made it so convenient for us that you can get the Bible app, put it in your earphones. It can talk to you. The word of God can, can speak for you. And you still don't read the word. You still, the Bible does not say, the Bible says, Jesus says, man shall not live by the word bread alone but what by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God the scriptures do not say that man shall live by sermons alone oh I'm gonna come for y'all who got your favorite preacher you don't listen to nobody but your little favorite preacher but can I tell you your favorite preacher is flawed can I tell you your favorite person is flawed and you gotta get in the book because guess what if their flaws find them out you still gonna have to believe it tell somebody I believe in the book I believe in the book. I believe what the word of God says. It may not come exactly when I want it to come. It may not show up, but I'm not going to be disappointed. I'm steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the word of God. So, uh, Paul says, whatever state I in, I'll be content. Tell somebody, tell them I'm steadfast. Unmovable, always abounding in the word of God. 
Sometimes the word tears me up. Sometimes the word encourages me. Sometimes it lifts me up. Sometimes it tears me down. But I'm grateful for the word of God being in my life. Why? Because when people forsake you, when people turn their back on you, guess what? I can still go to the book. And he'll find me in the book. You got to get back in the book. See, 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 Louis Farrakhan doesn't have to do sermons to Muslims about the Quran. Louis Farrakhan does never have to stand up and rebuke the Muslim community for not being in the Quran because it is a part of their initiation or conversion to Islam that they cannot live without being in the book. Watch this. And they are surrounded by people that believe in the book. We have more conversations about our favorite preacher than we are about the book. I know, I know that's old school and y'all like, no, y'all being too spiritual. Y'all try, but guess what? Who you come to when hell hits your house? You come to the spiritual people. You and in the Muslim community, oh, I done did my research. They keep each other accountable to what they read in the book. When the last time you asked somebody? But we call it too spiritual. Be seated. I got a haste along. I got to help you with something because Paul is clear, watch this, that he, he has to ensure before he addresses people's behavior, he addresses their identity. The problem with some of you is that you grew up in legalistic environments that taught you how to behave but didn't teach you who you are. That's why you were pregnant out of wedlock in a Pentecostal church. In a because you rebelled against the behavior. Because they didn't teach you. Because to teach you who you are requires that they know who they are. Now, I'm not this. Whoa, wait, wait. Before you think I'm discrediting my past and my history, I'm not. But I'm here to tell you that the word of God fills in the details. Touch your neighbor and say, I need the details. Okay, what details do you need? The first thing I want you to know, I need to tell you about yourself. If you're taking notes, I need you to write this down. That you, Genesis 1 and 27, says that you were created in the image of God. We live in a generation, and y'all put that up there, put my number one point up. God created man in his own image. You were created in the image of, of God. It is the Imago Dei. You were created in the image of God. You reflect God's nature. You reflect God's presence. You are perfect just the way that you are. When God made sure that he created man, he created mankind, he says, I'm going to do it in my own image. He says, I'm going to do it in my own image. You are a reflection of of who God is. You are not the TikTok filter that you keep putting on. I'm sorry. Y'all got some great AI photos. But, but y'all out here tricking people with these AI photos. You don't look nothing like that AI. AI needs to go bye-bye. You were created in the image of God. And here's the problem is some of you don't like your image. 
Some of you don't like the fact that your nose is a little bit wide. You don't like the color of your skin. You don't like your hair. You don't know. You wish you were taller. I wish I was taller. I wish I was a ball. I mean, you wish you were, uh, you wish you were, you know, I wish I went this wide. I wish I wasn't husky. When I wish my mama and my daddy wasn't husky, so I wouldn't be husky. But guess what, baby? You are fearfully and wonderfully made by God with your husky self. You don't need to change nothing about yourself. You, you, you were created in the image of God. And some of you are trying to change your image according to what the culture says. But that ain't who God created you to be. Let me tell you, if I do a DNA test right now, I can check them chromosomes. And them chromosomes tell me exactly who you are. I don't care what you feel like you are. I want to tell you what God created you to be. Tell him I was created in the image of God. And can I tell you that there's one thing that God does not mind that you like? He doesn't mind you liking yourself. I like myself. I like myself. Look at the neighbor and say, I like myself. Even if you don't like me, if you, even if you don't want to be around me, if you don't like my lips, you don't like my hips, you don't like my fingertips, it don't even matter. Why? Because I like me. Why? The Bible, y'all need Bible. The Bible says, love your neighbor as you love yourself. The reason why you ain't got no friends, the reason why you can't keep a friend is because you don't love yourself. You can't love nobody the way they need to be loved because you don't love yourself. I love myself. I take myself to lunch. I take myself to the movies. I love Nina, but I love me. That's not narcissistic, but I can't love her the way she needs to be loved if I'm insecure about me. And I break this spirit of insecurity. I break that insecurity off of you. I break that low self-esteem off of you. You've been living too long with that insecurity. Nobody didn't tell you you're beautiful, but I'm here to tell you you're beautiful. You're amazing. Somebody wants you. No matter who you who you wanted that didn't want you, there's somebody out there that will want this. All of this. Some woman, you ought to stand and say, somebody going to want all of this. All the single ladies ought to say, somebody going to want all of this. Tall, short, skinny, fat, don't matter what it is, somebody going to like all of this. Tell them all of this. All of this. All of this, all of this, all of this, all of this. Tell them I'm, my point number one is I was made in the image of God. I was created the exact way he wanted me to be. I wanted to play football. I know to be a safety in the NFL, I needed to be about 6'2". I'd be about six foot. They were not gonna, they were not going to get a 5'9 safety to be in the NFL. I just knew it. I just, I just knew it. No matter what my IQ was, I could see. Guess what? I don't care. God made sure that I was the height, watch this, for my assignment. God made sure that, guess what? You are fit and framed for your assignment. Stop comparing yourself to somebody else. You are fit for your assignment. Touch your neighbor and say, you fit for your assignment. You're the right height for your new assignment. You're the right size for your assignment. You got the right voice for your assignment. You wanted your ears to be smaller? I got big ears. I got a big head. But it's because of my assignment. My assignment requires this type of equipment. And I'm safe. Touch your neighbor and say, neighbor, I'm about to floor my assignment. Because I ain't wrestling over who I'm not. I'm not wrestling over who I can't supposed to be like. I don't need a voice like Bishop Jakes. I don't need a voice like Cheryl Brady. I don't need to be able to prophesy like Bishop Brady. I got my own equipment for my own assignment. So keep your armor. I got my slingshot and I'm about to kill my own child. 
because I was made in the image of God. I may not ever be able to play the bass like you, but I got the equipment for my assignment. I got the mind for my assignment. I may not be able to flow and worship like the Baker Boys, but I got what I need for my assignment. I may not be able to flow like you flow, but I got what I need for my assignment. I may not be able to play the drums like many plays the drums, but I got what I need for my assignment. Tell your neighbor, neighbor, I got what I need for my assignment. I may not ever be able to take a photo or, or edit like you, but I got what I need for my assignment. Somebody take 30 seconds, open up your mouth and thank God for your equipment, for what you fit with, for your assignment. I was blessed for the assignment. I was blessed for the assignment. Somebody tell me I got what I need for the assignment. I ain't wrestling another day over what I am and what I'm not. I'm good with what I got for the assignment. I wish I had a voice like Joseph, but I ain't got your voice. But I got what I need for my assignment. That's why I don't know why people compare themselves to other people. Because God uniquely blessed you for what you need for your son. The problem is people are so self-absorbed, they think that what they have cannot complement what you have. But the body of Christ is built upon our ability to be the body of Christ that every joint supplies. That when you flow in your assignment, when you flow in your assignment, when you are secure with your image, when you are secure with who you are, you're going to have to figure out when you flow in your we can flow together and we can win people for Jesus. But we can't win people for Jesus because we still fighting over somebody else's equipment. I don't need nothing you got. Be seated. Second thing I got to teach you. I need you to write this down in your notes. I'm not only a made in his image. Watch this. I am redeemed. The Bible says in Romans chapter 5, verse 12, I'm reading the Passion Translation. Pastor, I don't fell in love with the Passion Translation. Thank you, Jesus. It says, when Adam sinned, the entire world was affected. When sin entered the human experience and death was the result, and so death followed this sin, casting its shadow over all humanity because all have sinned. Can I tell you, what the Bible tells us that, what, that we, we were born into iniquity. We were, we, were born, we were born here. We were sinful when we got here. You're not sinful because of what you did. You're sinful because of what Adam did. And can I tell you why, why, why Adam fell? It was over a false image. If you eat this, if you eat these words, you can be like God. If you add this filter to this, you can be like God. But the truth is, they were already like God. And I and in that, we all fail. Uh, uh, um, um, St. Augustine calls it curvatus, that once the fall came, that 
All humanity was bowled over, covatus, that we were all bowled over, that we were unable because of our own free will, that we were not able to contemplate God, watch this, consistently. That we were not able to focus on God and his divinity and his power because of Kervatus, because of the fall. Because we fell short, watch this, of what God said about our image. So we get into the earth and we sin. Watch this. Them cute little babies was born in sin. <laughs> that's, that's what God created. And, and if you don't understand that I am not only made in the image of God, but watch this, I am redeemed. Okay, All right. I, I, I am redeemed. Uh, can, I, can I tell you, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7 says, He so richly in his kindness and grace... Yeah. That he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. He purchased, we just came out of resurrection time. He purchased it. He signed over it. So there was a penalty. There was a price on sin that only Jesus could pay through his blood. So what God does... If you think about it, if someone has to pay a ransom, y'all haven't seen the movies or whatever, or if, you, if somebody pays a ransom, they put a bounty, they put a price in order to rescue. And what Paul is teaching in Ephesians is that your redemption was paid through Jesus. Watch this. It was all ready, paid, watch this, in full. So he purchased you. Watch this. He released you from the penalty of the sin nature. See, y'all don't like this teacher. I can feel the legalism rising up. But it's already paid for. In other words, you need to take on the image as someone who has been chained and locked up. Right? Or some of you have spent uh, a few nights in jail. Amen. Praise the Lord. Uh, you know what it feels like to be behind those bars. But when they call your name, Leroy Jenkins. You tell all the people that got a record right there about how they responded. Let me tell you that. Right when they call your name, you know that somebody. You get your, you get your, you put your shoes on. You put everything on. You make sure you got everything that they allowed you to go in that cell in. But you already know when they call your name, the bell has been posted. Two days ago, two weeks ago, whoo, that two days ago, Jesus posted your bail from sin and death. That's why you don't get the opportunity to say you chose him. He chose you. Watch this. The scripture says before the foundations of the world, he chose you. He was just waiting on the right opportunity to call you. Look at somebody and tell him he called my name. Tell him I can't tell you where he called my name because some of y'all might judge me because when he called me, I was not at church. My dress was not this long. But tell somebody, tell him he called me. He knows your name. He knows exactly where you are. He knows your, he knows your social security number. He knows exactly who you are when he called you. And he posted your bed. He redeemed you. Now here's the thing. If you take that same image of being in the cell, 
If I call your name and the bailiff comes and unlocks the cell and says, you are free to go, but you stay in there? That's what happened when most of us got saved. We cried, we got baptized, we did all of this stuff, and they told you, you're a new creation in Christ Jesus. But what you did was, nobody told you, you had to get up out of that cell. You stayed in the cell and said salvation didn't work because you still had lust. You still had stuff you wanted to do. You still had your stuff that you wanted to get across. But you said, I gave my heart to Jesus so I secure my place in heaven. But what God says is, no, I, what I was calling you out of, I was calling you out of darkness into my marvelous life. What you have to do is, guess what? Prayer without the word is a useless exercise. God free you from the cell without your activity to find out who you are is useless. And some of us, the reason why we don't think that our faith works is because you chose to stay in your sin nature. You chose to stay in your sin conscience. You were in a church that taught you the rules, that told you regulations, that told you how to wear your hair, that you couldn't wear glasses because it was considered jewelry. Well, so I I'm supposed to be blind? What do you want me to do? <laughs> Touch your neighbor and say, I'm coming out of this cell. 2024 is a reset for me. He's called my name and I'm coming out of that cell. I'm coming out of everything because I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Somebody shout, I am redeemed. I ain't done with Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7. He says he not only redeemed us with the blood, he says, he forgave my sins. Uh oh. Two days ago, two days ago, the day before yesterday, he forgave your sins. Here's the problem that we have in the church. Some of you think that conviction is condemnation. And you are misguided by condemnation and calling it conviction. The enemy, when it relates to condemnation, oh yeah, the condemnation, watch this, condemnation is a recognition and conviction is a recognition of what I did wrong. But condemnation, y'all gotta, y'all gonna have to watch this back. Condemnation says, because you did it, God won't forgive you. Because it happened, watch this, you are condemned because of what happened. Conviction says, you did it, you forgiven, but you know good and well you better than that. See, y'all don't like that. See, I got to break that down. Let me break it down. Conviction is what God does in your heart and says, guess what? You, you better than that. You, you know good and well what Pastor Brady told you about your altar. And you, you know good and well. You came up here. You cried last week and still cussed out everybody this week. And, hey, and she and she talked you about lying, and you still turned around this week and lied to your kids. Lied. Where the real saints at? Conviction said, you know, good and well, a woman of God preached a powerful message, and you know you better than that. But the enemy comes says, you're not worthy. You're not made in the image of God. That, that, no, 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 you're condemned. You're not worthy. You're not, you're not, God doesn't love you. God doesn't care about you. You're nothing. And some of us, we can't worship 
because we're letting the enemy feed us. Watch this, because we don't have enough word in our voice to overcompensate for what the enemy's trying to feed in us. So you will only be controlled by the voice that you submit to. And it's, it's a sad day that you have Christians that submit to the voice of the enemy more than they submit to the voice of the word of God. This might not do too well on social media because... But what, what Paul does... Paul says, Bishop, you'll love this. He said, if anybody comes teaching anything else from what I taught, it is not the truth. And it's found in the law and in legalism. But Christ came to set you free. Your sins have been forgiven. Do you remember the other week in uh, uh, Easter Sunday? I said that Jesus showed up to the disciples and breathed on them. He said he also gave them a commandment. He said, go, watch this, go and tell the people their sins. You can verify. Go, their sins have been forgiven. Look at your neighbor. Say, neighbor, neighbor. your sins have been forgiven. Uh oh, wait a second. Uh, wait a second. Y'all don't want this. Not only the sins you have committed, but the sins that you will. Now, before you think that I just gave you a license to go and sin, God forbid. But the truth is that if you ever get yourself up in a jam, yes. Jesus is saying to you, I'm going to forgive your sin. And the truth of the matter is grace is not a law to sin. It's a law to live above the sin. That you should be more righteous with grace being bound with his love more than you are with the law. Y'all yeah. like that. Y'all like that. Y'all got them legalistic souls. Y'all need to be delivered from legalism. Y'all need to be delivered. Wow, you can't preach the gospel and not preach the forgiveness of sin. The reason why these young people don't want to come to church is because we keep throwing their sin up in their face. Why? Because we ain't got the power to deliver them from their sin. Tell somebody your sins have been forgiven. Your sins have been forgiven. Now, guess what? Now, there are going to be some consequences if your sins get found out. But can I tell you, God will forgive you. Now, I can't trust your family going to forgive you. That's good. That's good. That's good. But you're forgiven. Yeah. Touch your neighbor and say, I'm forgiven. In other words, I've already cleared you. Watch this. Redemption frees you from the cell. Come on. Forgiveness of sin. Watch this. Watch this. Clears your record. It expunges your record without community service. See, y'all don't like that gospel. He clears your record. Watch this. The question is, if God keeps no record of wrong, then why are you keeping a record of your wrong fight me it's in the book I used to what is it the O'Neill twist Jesus dropped the charges Jesus dropped the charges I used to like that song Choir anniversary. Jesus dropped. I didn't understand at 11 what Jesus dropped the charges. But I, when I went to college at 21, was in a fraternity. I, I Listen, I needed to say, Jesus dropped the charges. Jesus dropped the charges. Jesus dropped. I came back home to my daddy church and I was like, Jesus dropped the charges. Jesus dropped the Drop them, Jesus. (laughs) 
And the reason why y'all laughing, because you got some charges. Do I got anybody here that know that Jesus done dropped some of your charges? Touch your neighbor and say, neighbor, he will drop them charges. They can't find it on the record. They can't find it. No, you can go looking for it, but you ain't going to find nothing. Because Jesus dropped the charges. I'm forgiven. Touch your neighbor and say, touch your neighbor say, Tell the neighbor, say, I've been forgiven. See, this is your identity. I'm made in the image of God. I've been redeemed, and I am forgiven. So when the enemy comes and, and tries to torment your mind and tries to condemn you, therefore thou, for, it, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Tell the neighbor, say, I'm in Christ Jesus. Tell him, I'm not in my flesh. I'm in Christ Jesus. When Jesus, when God comes to look at me, he sees Jesus. Okay, I got, I'm in. Well, okay. Second Corinthians 5, 21. See, we got to, see, I want to tell you that there is a revival that is going to hit this church in prayer. But it's going to happen when there are people that are fully aware of who they are in God. Watch this. The Jewish culture, the Abraham, Abraham Isaac, Jacob, see their names meant something. So, so because their name meant something, it was always connected to Yahweh, the Father. So many of them never wrestled with who they were because their name gave them meaning. We got a whole lot of names that ain't got no meaning. So therefore, we don't, I know my name, I had to do research. My name, Travis, means bridge. I am a bridge. That's what I do. I connect people. If, if somebody is in need of something, I always can connect. And I, uh, I understand, well, like, why am I helping them? I don't even like this person over here, but why am I helping them? It's because my name... It means bridge. I, I don't even know if my parents knew that when they let my aunt name me. I mean, she's great. But, I mean, I don't know. I'm just joking. Uh, but, but, but my name means bridge. And uh, so we just name our kids anything and everything. We just put vows. I ain't going to start naming names because y'all going to get offended. Send Pastor an email and say, I'm offended by what Pastor Travis, because he called my baby name. I like Tashika Nika Ma Makaya. Kalea. Okay, that was a rabbit trail. I'm sorry. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says, For God made the only one who did not know sin to become sin for us so that we might become. What'd that say? What'd it say? No, no, that ain't what that said. Is that what that said? Of God, watch this, through our union with him, which means me and Christ are connected, watch this, because I am in him, so God made me right even when I wasn't right. He put me in right standing even when I was not doing the stuff Watch that. That's, that's what he did. Now, we will ha eventually have to step up to the standard in him. But his righteousness, can I tell you what righteousness is? Righteousness is holiness. God is saying, don't try to be holy before you are in union with me. Some of y'all got taught rules, but you didn't get taught righteousness. Righteousness is what 
Christ has done. And if I'm going to be in union with Christ, I have to, guess what? I have to step into his way. I have to step into his thoughts. If I'm going to be righteous, I have to step in his word. And the reason why we don't, we won't, 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 we will never say we are righteous is because we have never stepped into union with who Christ is. I need the mind, Philippians talked about the mind of Christ. I need the mind of Christ. I need the ways of Christ. I need to, listen, more than I want people to know my name, I need somebody to know Christ. I need Christ in my life. We always say shine Lord, but the only way you can say shine Lord or use me is I have to step into righteousness. In other words, I want to be like him. Somebody shout out, I am righteous. See, some of y'all didn't do that because the moment I, you heard me say that, you thought about all the things that's disqualified you from what it means to be righteous. In other words, before you were right, he put you on the right road. Before you were right, he turned you in the right direction. Tell somebody I'm right. <laughs> I'm right until I believe that I'm right. I'm right till I start acting right. I'm right. I have to believe it by faith that I am right till I start doing right, till I start talking right. Because guess what? I'm not going to be driven by who I think I am. I'm going to be driven by what he says. Somebody shout, I'm righteous. All right, all right. I got two more. Where my son at? Okay. He trying, he working today because he wants some V-Bucks, y'all. <laughs> he working today. I got, I got Zay Zay working today. So let's back up. I'm made in the image of God. I'm redeemed. What's the next one? And what's the next one? I'm righteous. Here's the other one. Romans chapter 5 verse 8 said, but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still yet sinners. The reason why most of us have an issue, watch this, with this verse, for God showed his great love or God so loved the world that he gave is because of your image of fatherhood. Y'all give me about 10 more minutes and I promise you. I'm gonna be like, listen. So you have an image of fatherhood that limits your ability to connect with your heavenly father. Come on, come on. Now, here's this. This is, this is what I taught them in. Here's the thing. Some of you have a bad image of a father. He yeah. was absent. He was not there. You didn't necessarily know him. Or he may, you know, it, it's, it, when you think of him, you think of devastation. Or you think, man, I would, you, th you have grief when you think of your father. And so when we say pray, father, or a man, build your own prayer life, you are alone with the father. You're alone, and it, and it sometimes, our human experience with a bad example of fatherhood yeah. distorts our relationship with our heavenly father. Yeah. Okay, that's the bad father. Okay, here is the good father. Yeah. Now, the good father, I had a good father. But can I tell you that the good father has standards. Yeah. He has a way of living. Yeah, 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 he has yeah. a regimen. Yeah. He has, he is disciplined. Yeah. He has a way of, he wants his grass cut. You could not mess up the lines in the grass. You had them lines had to be straight in the grass. Like you can tell that he was a man of order. Some of you have had fathers of order. You had, yeah, things had to be right. So here's the problem with the good father too. The problem is when I don't, when I I don't measure up to the standard, I stay away from the Father because I already know and I already think the good Father is going to judge me. That's so good. 
So I stay away from the bad father, and you who had good fathers, stay away from the good father until you get the type of behavior. And some of you never measure up and say, I would never be the type of man that my father was or is. Because his standards is just way yeah. too high. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what I want you to do is deconstruct the image of the good father and the bad father to understand that the God of the scriptures are completely different than even your finite belief of your father. Yeah. That you serve a God that is not mad at you. He is not even mad that you're not measuring up to his standard right now. He loves you, so you choose to stay where you are even though he loves you. Because you don't know what the word says. The word says that he loves you. He's waiting. He sent his only begotten son that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Some of you are acting so far away from God that your soul is perishing. You save, but you're malnourished. And you have a false image of fatherhood in your mind. But he loves you. He, is, he loves you. And all the messages that he's trying to send to you by messing up the stuff in your life that you think you should have had by now, he is trying to display his love for you because he never wants you to fall in love with stuff without ever falling in love with him. He loves you. Look at somebody and tell them, God loves your raggedy tail. He loves your messy self. He loves your gossiping self. He loves your little sinful self. He loves your little nasty, freaky self. Y'all don't like that. He loves you because your condition will not change his love for you. If God chooses not to love you, he is not a man of his word. If God does not send his son to die on the cross for you, then God is a liar. But God refuses to be a liar. God refuses for anybody to think that he is not the almighty God. God cannot lie. He cannot undo what he did on Calvary's cross. No matter how jacked up you are, no matter how angry you are, no matter how bad you think you are, he can't change the fact that he is forced to love you by his own word. I'm doing everything I can so that you are in union with me. Yeah. I got to deconstruct everything so that you know that even when you're alone, I'm still with you. Yeah. Even when you feel like you're a failure, yeah. I still love you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Even when you feel like you are going to falter along the way, I'm still with you. Yeah. Even when you mess up, prodigal son, I still have a role waiting on you. Matter of fact, I'm sending it to the dry cleaners every day in hopes that you will come back, prodigal son. I'm making sure that I keep the fatted calves, that they keep, uh, I keep every, all the fatted calves very nourished and they're feeding and they're grazing on the right grass because I just know I'm going to have a feast because my son is coming back home. The father knows exactly where the son is. As a matter of fact, because the son is of the father. The son is of the father. The son, there is something in the son that came from the father. So guess what? He says, my sheep know my voice. 
and a stranger they will not follow. You know my voice. You tried to ignore my voice. You tried to hide yourself. You tried to hide yourself, Adam and Eve. You hid yourself. You tried to hide yourself in all kind of stuff in the DFW area. You switched cities. You switched states. Trying to hide yourself not from people, but to hide yourself from your higher calling, which is in Christ Jesus. But can I tell you what God does? He's so in love with you that he doesn't care where you try to hide, Adam and Eve. Where art thou, Adam? Where are you, Eve? God will come looking for you. There's no mountain he won't climb up coming after me. No wall he won't kick down. Line he won't tear down coming after me. I came to announce to somebody who feels like you're far away from God that God is coming after you today. He's not coming after you because he's mad at you. He's coming after you because he's madly in love with you. So hide yourself, but I'm going to come and get you. You can hide in stuff that you don't agree with, that you know compromising your your beliefs, but I'm going to come get you. I'm going to come change you. Why? Because I love you. Somebody shout out, God, thank you for loving me through all my issues, through all my trifling ways. Thank you for not changing your mind. How far somebody said, God loves me. Tell them you ain't got to love me, but my father loves me. My father keeps me. He covers me. He protects me. Even when I don't want to be protected, he protects me. Even when I don't want to take his wisdom, he still covers me with his wisdom. Even when I don't want to be sheltered, he sends angels to protect me. Even when I lie. Somebody shout out, I'm loved. I'm loved. So you pray from a posture of being loved. You pray from a posture of knowing I am a son. Say, I am a son. I am a son. I am a son. Somebody shout, I am a daughter. All the women in here say, I am a daughter. All the men say, I am a son. I am a son, I am a daughter of the Most High God, and there's nothing that you can change about it. My place is secure. I am a son, I am a daughter. I am a son, I am a daughter. You can be suspicious about me, but you won't, you won't be able to change my place because I am a son, I am a daughter. So when I pray to my Father, I'm connected to Jesus because we are joint heirs with Christ. So whatever Jesus got access to I get access to I'm about to close here I said whatever I get access to oh, uh, Jesus has already got access to and tell somebody I'm in my rightful place tell them I'm getting in my rightful place tell them I am covered I am a son I am no longer an orphan Stay right there. Stay. I got to read this and then I got to let you go. Somebody shout, I'm loved. I'm loved. Next verse. Ooh. It says, and if you belong to Christ, come here, Zay. Then you are not Abraham's child. That wasn't the word. Do you believe? Paul is giving you some critical details he says I'm true heir of all his blessings I'm blessed not because of my last name I'm blessed because I'm in Christ and the promises I'm blessed because of the promises watch this not because of the promises God made to me or your mama or your grandmama because of the promises he made to who? He says, let me illustrate. As long as an heir, Galatians chapter 4 says, as long as there's an heir, is a minor. He is not really much of different than a servant, although he's the master over all of them. 
For until the time appointed by the father, the child is under domestic supervision of the guardians of the estate. So it is with us. When we were juveniles, we were enslaved under the hostile spirits of the world. But when the time of fulfillment has come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Yet all of this was so that he would redeem. He would redeem and set those who held hostage to the law so that we would receive our freedom and full legal adoption as his what? Children. Children. So that we would know that we are his what? True children. God released the spirit of sonship into our hearts. The fight against you is because you are a son. The enemy don't like the fact that you are a son. He says, moving us to cry out intimately, my father, my father, my true father, or Abba father. Now we're no longer living like slaves under the law, but we enjoy being God's very own sons and daughters. And because we're his, we have what? Access. You have what? Access. To what? Everything. What? Everything. Our what? Has, for we are his what? Because of what God has done. I came to my last point to you today is that you are a true son, that you are a true daughter, that you are a true child of God and you belong to God. So what it's saying here is when the time was right, God made sure that you recognize that you're his son and that you belong to God. I'm about to get out of here. But will you do it? This is my last time asking you to look at somebody beside you because you got to wake up the person beside you. But tell them, tell them I belong to God. Look at somebody and tell them I belong to God. Is the church sleepy in here? I said look at somebody and tell them I belong to God. Tell them I know what my last name says. I know what my birth certificate says. But tell them I belong to God. Everyone standing. I'm going to get you out of here. But you're a true son. The two daughters. And no matter what the enemy says, no matter what you've been faced with, no matter what's complicated or convoluted in your life, God is posturing you right now to remind you, married, unmarried, divorced, waiting on your boo, without a job, with a job, with what you want, without what you want. Nothing is going to separate the fact that we are his children. Stop praying to God like you are an orphan without a father. Stop worshiping God like he's not connected to the issues of your life. Stop trying to escape your reality and lift your heart yeah. to your father. Yeah, 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 yeah. Stop running from your father. Yeah. He's not mad at you, but he loves you with an everlasting love. He wouldn't have went through all that he went through to sin. His only begotten son for you because he loves you. I know some of you are sick or you're ill or you're trying to frust you're, you're frustrated. You lost a loved one and you're saying, well, 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 why would God allow this to happen if he loved me? God's ways are not our ways. My father's ways is not our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts. And even though I can question him, and even though I'm, I'm ailed by 
<laughs> Even though I'm confused at times of why God allows certain things to happen in my life. But here's what I did. Instead of blaming God for everything that happens in your life, there's certain things I know that I let in my life and it wasn't God who let it in. So what I want you to do is guard your heart with all diligence. Guard your righteousness. Guard your forgiveness. Guard your redemption. Guard your image. That's who I am. I am a child of God I am a child of God I am a child of God come on lift it up say I am Lift your hands and say, I am. I am a child. I am a child. 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 Come on, 
with every hair bow, every eye closed, if there's somebody here under the sound of my voice, it's time for you to come back to the Father's house. Yeah. I'm talking about in your spirit, in your soul. I'm talking about in your life that there, this is a sacred moment that it's time for you to give your heart back to God. It is time for you to recognize your true identity in Christ. If that's you with every head bowed, every eye closed, I just want you to slip up your hand and say, I'm ready to come home, Jesus. I'm ready to give my life to you. I'm ready to surrender to you. I'm ready. I, I recognize today I'm a child of who you created me to be. I am your child. Everyone repeat after me. Say, Lord Jesus, thank you because I am your child. You died on the cross for my sins. And on the third day, you rose again with all power in your hand. And I thank you for saving me, restoring me, for lifting me today. My seat is secure in heavenly places. My seat is secure because I'm a son and I'm a daughter of the Most High God. In Jesus' name, clap your hands and give God in my Father. There's a place. I am 
am free. I am free. I am saved. I am, I am lacking nothing. I am called to handle this. This stress will not kill me. Grief will not destroy me. No weapon formed the day. Because I am lacking nothing. I am lacking nothing. I need you to take about 60 seconds to breathe this in. You got to leave out of here and go to, into a week. You don't know what you're going to face. But God is saying today, put on the whole armor of God. Put on your whole strength. Come on. In worship is where we regain strength. In prayer is where we reset. Come on. Somebody take some time just to inhale this moment. Hey, yeah, 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 yeah. Hey. I'm going out of here stronger than I came in here. The weak beat me up, but God gave me strength. Thank you. That greater is he that is in me than he who is in the world. I am more than a conqueror. I am more than an overcomer. I am more than healed. I am more than saved. I am everything that God says I am. I, 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 that you lack, you can find it in his presence. The peace that you lack, you can find it in his presence. Come on, just breathe this in. Lift your hands up in worship right now. I know we're at the end, but your worship could bring a new beginning to you. It could activate your worship right now, has the possibility and potential of activating everything that we've heard from the Word of God today. Don't play with it. You don't have to be loud, but be reverent. Hallelujah. Lift your hands out of honor for the Word of God. Worship him because you know he's planted your feet in the right place. You need to be thankful now for the next seven seconds that you're in the right house, under the right covering, in the right atmosphere that's going to propel your purpose. Hallelujah. Lift your hands, everybody. Honor, honor, honor him. Honor him. Magnify him. Thank him. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Jesus, you didn't have to do it. Thank you, Father, I'm thankful you did. Come on, from the front to the right, from the right, the front, the back, come on, magnify in the union. Corporate learning be released. Hallelujah! 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 Come on, open your mouth and bless it now. Hey! Oh!
I'm looking at you. You got the beard, the white shirt on. Can you come here for a second? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Man, I don't know you. I haven't know that I've seen you before today, but I feel like you've got the attention of heaven. Asking yourself, I'm doing this, I'm believing, but I don't know for sure that what I'm believing is real. God told me to call you from the back of the church to the front just to tell you that what you're feeling is real. That the hand of the Lord is on your life. That there's an assignment from God that before you were in your mother's womb, he carved out your danger and he called you to be a man of God. The next several weeks, you're going to have encounters with the divine. God says, I'm about to show you for an undoubted reason that I have called you and I am with you and you are not losing your mind. You're not crazy. Those dreams are God. What you feel, what you're sensing is the hand of God on your life. God says, I interrupted and allowed the service to extend just to let you know that that's me pulling your hand. God says, I'm pulling you. I'm pulling you. I'm pulling you. Depression cannot have you. Come on. Come on. Those thoughts cannot consume. God says, I'm pulling you. Somebody release a shout of praise in this place. I'm pulling you. My hand is on you. My favor is on you. My purpose is on you. My calling is on you. My favor is on you. You are blessed and the devil cannot curse what God has blessed. Blessed in the city. Blessed in the field. Blessed to produce. Blessed to overcome. God says it was a minor setback, but the setback was just an opportunity for God to get the glory out of your life. If you're happy for this man of God, release a shout of praise in this place. His hand is on you. His hand is on you. That's my hand on you. I've called you. I've ordained you. I've set you apart for such a time as this. Made in the image of God. Can we get some rejoicing in the room? Can we get some rejoicing in the room? Clap your hands, everybody. Clap your hands, everybody. Stay right there. Stay right there. Hallelujah. Glory. 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 Ho, 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 ho. Yes, Lord. Push on your neighbor and shout, yes, Lord. Y'all ain't pushing on nobody. Push your neighbor like you're pushing them over and say, yes, Lord. If you'll do it right, it'll activate something on your room. Push all of them and shout, yes, Lord. Now, my brother here, that's your, I can't see you, your wife came up, all right. Number one, you ain't crazy. Because you've been hearing crazy, whether it was to your face or whispers, since your encounter with God at 13 years old. It was the angel... Lord that walked in I almost feel like he poured a oil or a horn of oil on you at that age those that were around you in that season didn't understand the shift and the change matter of fact they would call and say stop mocking this preacher stop mocking they, they called it mocking but when you would hear it, you would see it. It would resonate in your spirit. And before you knew, you were spiritually mimicking what you saw and heard. God said, I've not left you. 
you were in the pasture for this season waiting for a day. Today is the day that you'll face your giant. Slay that giant. Free your house. Free your future. And activate your destiny. I might as well go ahead and tell you the hand of God is on your life. They tried to shelter it. They tried to snuff it out. They tried to put their foot on it and stomp it. But God said, I brought you in this place today to take my hand and pick you up and activate the anointing of God that's in your life. You're getting ready to do exploits. I just want the church to take your prophetic finger, press it toward, stretch it toward, and shout, it's not too late. Today is your day of apostolic turnaround. Now clap your hands and praise it. And, and the burdens, baby, let me see you here. You, the burdens you've been, I saw you been over. Of course, that was worship. You were been over weeping because of the validity of the word of the Lord from Pastor Joe and myself. You were thanking God for meeting you and your husband today. But even in that bending over, I saw how the weight, without me going into detail, I saw the weight. I want to say especially the last six and eight months. I've saw the weight since back before Christmas, Thanksgiving. That, that's when it was. I saw the weight. See, the Lord knows you, baby, and he knows what took place during that. He even knows what, how you've had to stand strong in the face of family. There's been so many family crises, and I'm not talking about just in your house with your husband or children. If you have them, I'm talking about family outside. All right, let me go on. But God said today, I just had a flash of some things, but just took my breath of how people have tried to just kill y'all. To just destroy you. Marriage, your faith, your family. But God said today, I've come to redeem it. I've come to restore it. I've come to rescue, hallelujah. I've come to revive. Restoration is being released upon your lives today. Yes. I trust you don't feel like we're just prolonging a service. There's a visitation of God in this house right now. There's a visitation over this house right now. There's a cloud of glory that's making on me go ahead. I wish you would reach up and pull down a piece of glory. This child, I am. I don't think in 46 years of prophesying across the world, I've never used this word. I, I just, some of these attacks between uh, coming to tear you guys up has been such a sinister onslaught of the enemy. But I read people today as your prophet, hear me at this moment. These enemies, sir, ma'am, you will see no more. God said, I've shut the mouth of the lions that have been roaring against you to devour you. It's over. 
I need 300. No, I need 600 people. I need all those in the overflows. I want you to shout, it is over. I want you to think of something in your life that's been chasing you. I want you to think about something that's been chasing your family and shout, it is over today. It's over. I need you to bear down and grit and shout it. It is over. Turn around three people. These enemies you shall see no more. God bless you. Love you. Keep you. Smile on you. Help you. Guide you. Look at that. Come on. Clap your hands to this man and woman of God. He's going to do great things in their lives. And I so my mic keeps going out. I just touch him again. I just saw a financial. Come on back, baby. You need to grab his hand on this one. He's going to bless you too. I just saw a financial increase over your house. I just saw promotion. I even see things from 10, 15, and 20 years that the uh, in debt and things that are still chasing that it's just like, you know, you almost, you get caught, it's almost there, and then there's a setback. God said, no more setbacks. I'm going to financially, he said, I'm going to walk in the house, get in your computer, get in the computer from a business, a company, a school, and God said, the spirit of cancellation is coming. I will make you dead free. I'll free you from what is trying to hold and constrain you and limit your future. You will live like you desire to give. You will bless others like you desire to bless. My God, clap your hands. I can keep going. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, give him a hallelujah. I said, church, give him a hallelujah. While you're shouting, tell your neighbor, you ain't seen nothing yet. The hand of God is getting ready to drop on this house. And if you get in this space, you can't help but be blessed. Glory, glory. I said, if you get in this space and in that atmosphere, you and your household can't help but to be blessed. If you even bring the devil in, he's going to leave out a blessed devil because the blessing of God is in this house. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Every enemy is being cut off in your Every enemy is being cut off in your praise. What are going to do about it? I said every enemy is being cut off in your praise. Come on, lift us, Shabbat. Now, Pastor Jordan brought the spirit, prophetic spirit, atmosphere, and I, it's, it's late, and we're not going to keep you, but I could prophesy to at least 200 of you right now, because it's in the room. Oh, glory, tell your neighbor, it's in the room. <laughs> Every... Yeah. We're getting ready to pray over somebody else that pastor wants to pray for and agree with. But I, before you started prophesying, I was going to take the microphone and just confirm the atmosphere yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that we are in a space. And what you do and how you conduct yourself how you manage your life and affairs and how you manage your worship, how you manage your obedience is going to determine if you get what God's assigned in this space. There's always a space of grace that God gives you and when he opens that space for you, 
You got to make sure you go in with clean hands and a pure heart, Pastor says. With your, not perfect, but your attitude's right. Matter of fact, you, you need to preach to somebody next to you right now and say, not perfect, but your attitude's right. Stop trying to think you have to be perfect to enjoy or reap the benefits of the cloud of glory that's over your life. Hallelujah. That's what Pastor preached about today. We'll pray for someone, but I want to tell you this is apostolic instruction. Now you hear that from on high, from the anointing, from my ability to see what not just next Sunday, but Sunday after that, after that, after that, after that. Throughout this summer, we're going to ride this wave. I got 30 people in agreement. I said, we're going to ride the wave. Household members are going to be saved. Families coming back together again. Aunties and uncles, hallelujah, are going to repent. Hallelujah. Yes, yes, yes. Children are going to come into alignment with your leadership. So be a leader in your house. Hallelujah. I said be a leader in your house. They'll submit to leadership if they see it in you. But I did want to come before you to tell you next Sunday I don't want you I don't want no fights to break out trying to get in this room so that just means you got to come on time come early come with a if you ain't coming with a praise don't let them come through the doors ushers and greeters if they ain't got a smile if they don't have a y'all y'all in come on if you don't have an unction you know just tell them you got to wait till you get it together because the place is going to be filled with praise and where there's a praising people God will interrupt anything and everything to get a miracle right to you where is the praisers hallelujah praise him hallelujah hallelujah hey hey Glory, 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 glory. We trying to go, but it's just like Jeremiah said. It's like fire. Where is it? It's shut up in my. Yes, Lord. Lord. Hit your neighbor and tell him it's just like fire. Shut, shut up in my bone. Come, Messiah. Come, Messiah. Hallelujah. Let go and let God. That's what the old saints said, baby. Let go. Let go of yourself and let God have his way. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, before I mention next Sunday, I want to take a moment and thank God. It takes grit, grime, and guts to preach like Pastor Travis preached today. You can't look at people's face, see their attitude, and preach like that today. How many know that was a word from on high? It was anointed and appointed for me. It was anointed and appointed for you. What you gonna do with it? Don't walk out of church like you walk out of a restaurant. Smack your lips and say, that was good. And just go on about your business. Eat this over and over. Chew it. Let it get down in your spirit. Hiya, my side. Don't you miss next Sunday. I'm telling you, the man of God's been here before, so he needs no introduction he will tap in right where this church is at in this moment and in this season. That's apostolic. It comes for confirmation, establishment. Then his prophetic gift is going to open 
because of your cooperation of the establishment and the agreement of the apostolic. It's going to put a demand on him to open up to the prophetic. So you don't want to prophesy where there's no order. Where there's not unity. You don't, you don't prophesy the future over people that ain't going nowhere. But if your mind is made up. You going all the way into your purpose. No matter who it leaves, you have to let go of and who you have to agree with. It's going to take that type of anointing in your life to see. And the prophet will open up the future for this church. He will open up the next six months explicit. He'll open up. God's going to do this. Then he's going to do that. Then he's going to open this. And he's going to open that. He'll increase this and enlarge that. I believe it, I know it, and I trust it. You in agreement with me? Don't be late. Don't wait. Don't be late. Amen. Be here and be here with a praising attitude of receptivity. Hallelujah. Pastor Joe, go right ahead. Can we thank God for Bishop, Pastor Travis, Pastor Brady, our leadership. Real quickly, this will take two minutes. Pastor Sanchez, I just wanted to bless your daughter. I remember uh, when she was a little girl. What's your name? Faith. I remember Faith worshiping as a little girl at the river. And she's entering into a new season of her life. She's here for a college visit. And while Bishop was ministering, it's like I heard God say, I had to bring you full circle to remind you of what I told you when you were a little girl. That this is a full circle moment for you. That there's destiny activation for you. And I'm not going to take a long, but Pastor, can, we, can you just pray for, just bless her? We just want to bless you in the name of Jesus. As you walk into your future, we just pray that there are no stumbling blocks. We pray for open doors and opportunity. We pray for financial open doors, God, that they would meet her everywhere she goes, God. I pray now that she doesn't come into any stumbling block, God, and we reactivate who you made her from the time she was a child, God. Let her dreams come to pass. God, the faithfulness of her parents, let it be lived out in this next season of her life. God, as they drop her off in college, they're not going to have to worry because you're going to give your angels charge over her. That the classes would be easy. That the, she would understand, God, internships and opportunities, scholarships and finances. Let it not be a problem in the name of Jesus. But beyond the academic, I stir up the spirit of God that's in you. Such as I have the worshiper that's in you. The worshiper that's been in you since you were a child. We activate it again in the name of Jesus. Thank you, God, because only you do things this well. Be blessed, faith. Be blessed in Jesus' name. Somebody clap your hands and tell God thank you. Amen, amen, amen. Is anybody grateful for what God is doing in this season? Hallelujah. Next Sunday is Pastor Brady's birthday celebration. Her actual birthday is on the 17th, but we'll celebrate it here. And if you have any cards, if you have any gifts, be sure to bring them. And uh, she loves cars, and she reads every last one of them. So please bring a car, write a special note, and it will be so uh, beautiful for her. Our Better Together Marriage Ministry will be on site. Uh, okay, three of you are better together. But for those of you that are excited about your marriage, come out on Pastor Brady's birthday, the 17th at 7 p.m. Register now to attend. And again, we already told you that the Allen Food Pantry Outreach, we were able to donate 300 pounds of food, so keep your giving up. God, we are just so excited for what you're about to do. We're thankful for everything you said for this reset series that we're in. God, reminding us of who we are in you as we go out of this place, but never from your presence. God, we ask that you would lead us to the hurting and lead us to the broken. But God, when people look on us, let them see you. On your way out the door, somebody shout, shine, Lord. We'll see you next Sunday. God bless you, Father of Lord.